Okay, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Yasaman Shuri. Um, Yasaman is interested in new technologies and specifically how materials and objects can be created and how we interact with them. She's a faculty at the Copenhagen Institute of Technology and she's a core designer for Windows Holographic uh, working on the Microsoft HoloLens and she has received multiple design awards for her work and today she's talking to us about perceived sense augmenting design interactions. So welcome, Yasemin. I'm a designer. Uh, I come from a background of physical design, so industrial design. And over the last five years, I've had the privilege of working at Microsoft HoloLens for Windows Holographic. I'd like to mention that this um, presentation is not uh, sponsored by Microsoft, and anything I say is not related to Microsoft, just to um, make that clear. But over the last few years, um, coming from a background of thinking about physical things and then having the chance to think about operating system and digital things, I've had a lot of uh, time to actually practice looking. And I think this kind of practice of looking has made me realize there are deeper questions about how we perceive the world. Um, I like this quote uh, by John Berger, who recently passed away, so I'm <laughs> making a little tribute here, um, that seeing comes before words, that uh, the child looks and recognizes before it speaks. So seeing is actually an important aspect of how we understand and perceive the world. Um, in fact, it's, it's inherent to how we believe the world is created, and it's aff affecting what we think. Um, I, I thought I stopped in the right place. Let's see if it. Um. This is the first of four programs in which I want to question some of the assumptions usually made about the tradition of European painting. That tradition, which was born about 1400, died about 1900. Tonight, it isn't so much the paintings themselves which I want to consider, as the way we now see them, now in the second half of the 20th century. Because we see these paintings as nobody saw them before. If we discover why this is so, we shall also discover something about ourselves and the situation in which we are living. I tried to skip this part, but <laughs> we get to experience it together. <laughs> The process of seeing paintings, or seeing anything else, is less spontaneous and natural than we tend to believe. A large part of seeing depends upon habit and convention. All the paintings of the tradition used the convention of perspective, which is unique to European art. Now, perspective centers everything on the eye of the beholder. It is like a, a beam from a lighthouse, only instead of light traveling outwards, Appearances travel in, and our tradition of art called those appearances reality. So I really like that quote because he talks about how the way we see the world affects of how we perceive reality. Now, I'm sure that you're familiar with all the new technologies that are rapidly um, coming out um, with uh, artificial intelligence, with um, how we pers um, augmented reality, virtual reality, and all sorts of new kinds of technology that let us perceive the world in a different way and affect the way we see. I won't go through them, There's n it's not necessary, but I, I encourage you to follow um, the technologies that are rapidly affecting our, uh, our world. So as I said, I've been thinking a lot about how we perceive the world, and in the last five years, I've been working in the augmented reality space, which meant that I had to think about what is augmentation. And it seems that it's very similar, or at least related, to how we think of simulations. So I want to kind of talk about that a little bit. If we think of a flower, we could think of the flower having certain kinds of properties, like it might be living, or it might be, um, grow it, it might be growing. Um, but this we also call a flower. 
it's a plastic flower, right? It's mass manufactured, there's probably a dye that creates that flower, but we call it a flower because there are certain properties that remind us of maybe it's the shape, maybe it's the way that it looks of what a flower is. So in some sense, that's like a cre simulation of a flower. Artists for a long time have been simulating ways that we perceive our space and light. For a long time, um, Italian artists and European artists have been painting the sky um, of chapels to make it seem like it's an infinite sky. But also, there, there are new artists playing around with light, trying to create artificial light. So this is actually an artificial light, but we perceive it as something that looks like real light. But we also simulate spaces and simulate actions too. This is Biosphere 2. We're in Biosphere 1, which is Earth, and so they called it Biosphere 2. It's, a f um, debate. it's kind of like a failed project from the 70s in Arizona, um, in Tucson, and I had the privilege of visiting it. But essentially, they tried to build the ecosystems of Earth and replicate it in the first closed system inside um, this geodesic dome. And it's really interesting because they try to simulate the processes of life. And so in some senses, it's not just the physical qualities, but also the processes that humans have been trying to always simulate and understand. Of course, these all have different kinds of purposes, right? Like the flower you might put as decoration in your house, but this obviously isn't a kind of decoration. It's more for research and other reasons. So. When I look at the history of computing and simulation, of course simulation is, has a longer history than this, but I come to, as we may think, an article written by Vannevar Bush in 1945. I believe it's in the Atlantic, but I encourage you to read it. But he talks you know, about all these new kinds of technology, uh, technologies in, in the future, being able to create certain kinds of um, objects and certain kinds of uh, technological objects. So actually he influenced a lot of people to, for example, the hypertext, um, uh, people to think about the new kinds of things we have today. Like he talks about the thinking machines and so forth. But the reason I'm talking about him is because actually he, he all, there's kind of like a chain reaction of people that he's influenced. And he influenced Douglas Engelbart, who wrote this um, th um, book, or uh, it's like a thesis, on augmenting the human intellect. And in it, he talks about augmentation. But he talks about it in a way that we don't think about it today, like augmented reality. But of course, the ideas are very much the same. So he had the mother of all demos, which is the mouse, one of the first mice. And he was kind of the inventor of the mouse. And he writes about it like so. The mouse was just a tiny piece of a larger project to augment a human intellect so that we can extend from ourselves this con concept of augmentation and be able to have more powers as humans. That kind of led to, well, all these kinds of work in that time, or as you can see, it's a very similar time, 1968, um, was the first um, head-mounted uh, head display, HMD, uh, called the Sword of Democles by Ivan Sutherland. I will try to play a video, if it works, um, of this. So this is Ivan Sutherland in 1968. And this is the Sword of Democles. And as you can see, it's a head. Uh, it's an object attached to the head, and as he moves around, it's a virtual, basically, cube. Um, and so, if we back to go back here. So, of course, all these thinkers have been contributing to the field of augmented reality, head-mounted display, and being able to perceive the world through a new kind of um, a layer that we can put on top of our uh, eyes. And Jaron Lanier, who is also um, a Microsoft employee who is doing research, has been doing research in virtual reality and coined the term virtual reality, um, has done all sorts of experiments, including the hemo 
hem nuclear flexibility, <laughs> which is kind of like if you had a third arm, what it might be like. So there's lots of people doing these kinds of projects. There's um, Jeremy Balenson, who was here, I, I believe, earlier, and, and um, others who are kind of looking at this space. So this has been around for a really long time, these kinds of thinking, right? And Artists have been exploring what it might be like to add to our vision or to augment our vision. And perception is something that comes, you know, very naturally with this kind of thinking. So I really like this project. Um, it's by Mel Slater in Barcelona. And he, he does this project where um, they, they put on a virtual reality headset and, they, and the person sits in front of someone that appears to look like Sigmund Freud. And it's kind of a psychology experiment where the, the patient uh, who has the headset on tells Freud his problems and his worries. And then with a, some form of input, like a click of a button, um, it switches the point of view from the patient to Sigmund Freud. And now the person who's perceiving the space is actually Sigmund Freud looking back at the, per the person who was just a minute ago telling him his problems. And now it's his turn, even though it's himself, has to tell himself back and console himself about his own problems. So, and this is not something that came with virtual reality. It's actually existed before in, in psychology. And for example, people would put a chair and you would sit in the chair and then you would put another chair in front of you. So there would be two chairs. One is empty, one is uh, someone. And so they say their own problems and imagine that a therapist is sitting in front of them. And simply, once they're done, by the act of getting up and moving and sitting down on the other chair, they play a different role of, say, Sigmund Freud or some psychologist. And so they try to console themselves. So we've been augmenting and perceiving the world and having this ability to imagine and, and shift our way of thinking for a long time. And now that we can do it with vision, it's definitely something that um, it's going to affect how we perceive. As you can see, he's kind of looking back at himself here. We've also been doing, we've also done experiments um, around how we perceive our own body, of course, uh, there are lots of people here in Stanford doing it. And so um, you can see that uh, one of the hands is the, uh, this woman's hand, and the other hand is actually a simulated hand. And when they touch the simulated hand, she can actually not see her own hand. She can only see the you know, simulated hand, which I think is made of plastic or something like that. When they touch the simulated hand, simply by seeing it, she, she feels like she's it's her own hands. So you can see that the senses are playing tricks on our mind too. So there's a lot of senses connected to one another. It's not just touch, it's also um, vision, and there's kind of like a play there here. This project is by a Microsoft Research um, employee who actually looks at haptics, and haptics in a kind of new sense. Uh, I'll explain what he is doing here. So he, and I've had the ability to try this without knowing what it was, and it kind of blew my mind, so I'm very excited to tell you about it. Um, so actually the per patient is wearing an Oculus Rift, and on top of the table there's a connect. So it's kind of, he, it's sensing that there's an object on the table. And the object is just a cube, right? So it's just one cube. And in the virtual space, you see four cubes. And the four cubes, you go to grab them. So every time you go to grab them, it's the same cube. So the user actually grabs the blue cube and moves it, and then grabs the green cube and moves it, and then grabs the red cube and moves it. And then when they take off the headset, they realize they've been moving that one physical cube the whole time. And the way that's happening is that every time, because the cube is being tracked and because the hand is being tracked, every time the, the user moves the cube, the world shifts with their hand. So they're actually shifting the world as they move the cube back and forth. So you have this perceived sense that where you're grabbing it is a different space than, than you're actually grabbing it. So it's harder to explain. I hope you get a chance to try it. But you can see that 
how the person perceives it and what the reality is are quite different. So I like to think that objects embody a way of seeing, meaning that whatever that we design for it and how we embed these kinds of thinking, like this one that I mentioned, makes us perceive it differently. And I want to talk about a few different things. So I want to talk about new materials, old paradigms, and hybrid objects. Let's start with new materials. So if we think about digital objects, since that's kind of where I'm focusing on right now, is that uh, digital objects have properties that expand beyond physical objects, right? For example, they can be deleted, right? They can be resized, which is something that kind of blows your mind, right? Because in the real world, you can stretch things, but you can't really duplicate the atom just by simply resizing it. And here you can see in virtual reality that you're resizing it. They can occupy the same space, right? So this is kind of a funny image of two quote unquote things that we perceive, but occupying the same space. I thought this was kind of funny, but they can be copied. And I think this is funny also because the concept of money is, is a symbol itself for something bigger. And here the person is copying them. Certainly with ma mass manufacturing we can copy too, but instantly being able to duplicate something is something that's an inherent uh, property of a f digital object. So this one is about the person's holding like a, a representation of a world and by bringing it close to their face, they enter that world. So that object is actually representing something deeper. So that's also related to not just um, representation, but also scale. In the real world, we can't do that, right? We have to walk through a physical space. But here, you can go from macro to micro um, just using symbols. So there's all sorts of things that digital objects have properties of. Of course, this was only a few that I happen to think about. Um, but, but it kind of speaks to a new kind of materiality that designers have to consider, right? Um, when I think about something scaling, I design it differently than when it's not scaling. Um, but let's talk about now, so those were new, new capabilities. Let's talk about old paradigms. What do I mean by this? Um, well, the context of every of these capabilities um, what are they meant for, right? Like, why would I want to put two objects on top of one another? Is that something I even want to do? But definitely, that's a capability. In the real world, we don't do that. Like, two objects are made of matter. They don't occupy the same space. Um, certainly, some virtual objects do not follow some things that we have in the physical world, like matter, like temperature, like... Um, you know, evolution like being able to grow, or um, physics like collision, and all sorts of things, right? We can think of it instantly, especially with haptics technology being so um, slowly growing. Uh, w the first thing we think about with holograms or virtual reality is that you can't touch anything, right? But I just showed you two, a hand on top of a box. But in this one, you can see that a person can throw something and it feels like it's being thrown on the ground. And another one is actually the fact that you can stack them. So they could have designed it completely differently. They could have put all the boxes on top of each other. And when you go like this, it doesn't move, right? But they designed it in this way. So the question is, designers have for a long time connected these known and kind of comfortable ideas of what we already know and symbols to ease the user into understanding. So that physics, that being ability to stack something are things that we're carrying from the physical world and kind of embedding it in the virtual space. This is a perfect example of industrial design. We call them affordances. So that little kind of raised, not raised space on that uh, seemingly sticker makes you feel like you can put your hand and kind of rip it off, or that's where you want to grab it from, not from the other side. These knobs and p are asking you to push them, or pull them, or to turn them, right? So they have inside them mm, instructions for how you should interact with them. 
So this kind of thing is very common to designers of physical objects. This is how designers bring known things of understanding the hand, for example, that the hand wants to do these kinds of things, and they bring it into the design. Now, for a virtual space, it's a little bit different. So we have to think about that, too. So embed existing knowledge into objects that help us perceive them really help the person who's perceiving it to understand what the intention of it must have been. So of course, everyone talks about skeuomorphism. And skeuomorphism is when, well, skeuomorphism is to s simulate design cues from the original. So when we talk about, when we talk about skeuomorphism, a common thing that comes up is the, when the first iPhone came out. And people constantly talk about um, having leather-like features. So you see leather that really feels like leather, or button really felt like a button that you could feel like you can push and pull. And these are kind of tactics that designers have been using in the digital space to be able to simulate for you an action that you feel comfortable doing. So this is another example, of course the symbol of paintbrush, we understand coming from an old paradigm of a paintbrush and a paint, um, I don't know what you call this, but a, for paint, you know that you're going to go into something that is about painting, or games, or clock. These are kind of uh, the beginnings of what we call the desktop metaphor. The, the desktop itself comes from a metaphor of real world. And so, of course, in my work, I had to rethink all that because it's no longer a flat screen of a desktop. It's a virtual space that's within your space. So these kinds of thinking really came in handy when you're trying to transition the user into something new. Which, so if these are old paradigms, how do we think about these kinds of new objects that are virtual, have new capabilities? Can we leverage these old paradigms? Should we leverage them? Well, these hybrid objects, um, in some ways, designers have the choice. So they, in some ways, they have a tool built. The box that I showed you where you can stack it, you can choose, depending on the context, that you can stack it or not stack it. So what, why would a designer want to do each one is kind of part of their tool belt of being able to do something. So it becomes more of a question. Should an object be able to be duplicable or not? Should an object be scalable or not? For what reason? Should an object have mass or not? Should it exist in the same space of another object? Should it be um, deleted and so forth? OK, up until this point, I've talked about pretty standard ideas of design, where designers think about formal aspects and kind of more aesthetic aspects that affect usability what we call user experience. So in order for me to have a sense and assurance that I can actually click on that paintbrush and go into a paintbrush app as opposed to, let's say, on a clock app, um, it just makes me feel more reassured. But I believe that we're entering a new kind of era of moral objects or moral world, which is part of the design experience and, of course, everyone else who is building the experiences with us. So I'd like to do a simple experiment. Um, imagine that there's an object. Imagine that this object is a tree. Where do you perceive this object? Is it here? Is it over there? Is it in your hand? Is it on the roof, on your phone? Is it somewhere else, like in Paris? Where is it? How would you represent it, right? Is it just the sound of leaves? Maybe it's not visual at all. Can you smell it? What does it smell like? Does it smell like pine? If there are leaves, what do they feel like? Are they spiky or are they soft, right? Is it plastic? What is it made of? What are the properties of this? What is it like visually? If I showed you these three trees, obviously each one has a different connotation and a different history that comes with it. If you look at the one on the right, it definitely does not look very welcoming. It might even look scary. The one on the left 
might remind you of Christmas, holidays, festivity. The one in the middle might remind you of oriental uh, space, or it might make you feel like Zen garden, or something like that, right? What size is it? So you imagine the same ones. Now imagine it a tiny thing. So that scary one, if it was this tiny, it kind of looks cute. It doesn't look scary. But imagine if the Christmas tree that's kind of festive, if it was giant and you couldn't even get yourself out of it, it would be much more scary. So depending on how you design the size and the shape, it really changes your perception of how you see it. So you can see that as I ask these questions, we're kind of shaping the tree's identity. Is it pine? Is it soft? Is it scary? Is it big? Is it small? So all these identities make us judge that experience and perceive it. But as I mentioned, these are all details, formal details, and aesthetic qualities that as designers we've just kind of always been trained to think about. Now I want to con continue this experiment to another, um, another side. So imagine that someone else can see it. Now that same tree that you've been thinking about, imagine one other person can see it. Or maybe this whole group can see it. Who should and who should not see it? Maybe only me and Ingmar see it, but no one else sees it. Who owns it? Do I own it? Or maybe everyone owns it. If someone cannot, then what do they see instead? So if I can't see it, what do I see, right? Do I see anything? Maybe I see nothing. So as you can see that when I ask these kinds of questions, they're not moral, I'm sorry, they're not aesthetic and they're not formal details of the identity of the tree, but they're also about the social interactions that we have with one another. So what is citizenship? What is a human right? What, maybe it's everyone's right to be able to see that. Maybe it's actually just the teacher's right to see it. So these are kind of like class systems and privacy and human rights, ownership, citizenship. These are kind of questions that come into play. Now, as a designer, I have to think about this, right? So you imagine what my background is and what four other designers' background might be. We might have difference of opinion over something that seems so moral. So, the interpretation of the symbol that I just spoke about is dependent on the context of the object, right? Now, let's scratch the tree and go back to something different, like a clock, right? So a clock is a symbol, the symbol for time. It's a little bit tricky one because it's time. Um, consider the same object was now a clock. So it's 10 o'clock. Well, 10 o'clock could be morning, afternoon, or it could be evening, right? Well, in, in the way that we perceive 10, some other people say 22, <laughs> which helps actually that differentiation. But this feels a lot different than this, right? But it looks the same. If you see two clocks, you might think, at this, if you see them at the same time, you might think, well, maybe one is representing a certain geographical space, whereas the other one, uh, a different geographical space. Maybe one is New York, one is Paris, right? But now imagine that I showed one of you 10, and then I showed the other one 3. But you're both in the same space at the same time. What kind of um, differences of interaction would that create for you? Would that just create confusion? I don't know. Maybe that's how we can manipulate. But you can see that the object itself can be embedded with this kind of uh, intelligence, that it can choose the viewer and change itself based on the viewer. That this object is not like a fact-checking object that's the same for everyone. Because when I look at this chair, probably most of us perceive it very similarly in, in, in the way that it's, um, like we can all touch this area and we know that this area is where it exists. But what I think of this chair, whether it's beautiful or not, is where we might defer, which is the formal aspects that come from kind of our idea of what this chair might be. So as designers, or as a designer, I have the potential to create something that can transcend space and time, right? Like the clock I showed you. But we have also the potential to create something that could be confusing. 
So if I see 3 o'clock and you see 10 o'clock, we might not find out until we have a meeting to, with one another, and that might be super confusing. But what if we just never found out? What if we lived our lives seeing different things all the time? So these are kind of moral questions and user experience questions that kind of overlap. So the properties of digital objects could be different for me and for you, yet still be the same at the same time as we experienced. I, I kind of want to finish I, I would love to um, finish a little bit early, so I'll try to go through this fast, because I'd love to have a discussion and answer questions, but mostly I'd like to have a dialogue. So the last bit that I'll talk about is other sensory interactions. So what might simulating these other things might be like, right? What if it's touch and taste? Well, certainly, in the last little while, or actually historically, we've mostly thought about, especially in digital space, we've thought a lot about vision. Like vision we talk about all the time because it's really, really important and we've been able to do it, right? So on the left is a alt space VR, which is a virtual reality social uh, game. And, but also we think about sound. For example, in HoloLens, we have uh, geolocated sound. So a sound could be over there versus over here. So this is also something that we've been focusing on. The last one is haptics. This is something everyone's focusing on. But these three, haptics, sound, vision, is something that everyone's focusing on and we constantly think about. But what does it feel like as a designer or as someone who's thinking about simulation and augmentation when they begin to think about, let's say, taste? So this is in vitro meat, one of the first meats that was made from not a cow. And this is animal-free milk. So are we going to simulate what we already know about what milk is? What aspects of it? Are we going to bring protein and calcium and these kind of nutritional aspects? Or are we going to make it just white? Is it going to feel like milk? Like, what is that? And why are we doing it? Maybe we're doing it because we don't want animal cruelty. And we want, like, let's say, vegans f help more people become vegan, let's say. Or uh, we might be doing it for sustainable reasons. Whatever the reason is, how the context forms, we're going to make a few decisions about how we simulate milk or how we simulate uh, meat. You might say that, in some ways, this is very skeuomorphic of our time to be making kind of meat and milk seem exactly like meat and milk, seeming in our mouth. But maybe later on, our children and their children might never even want steak or meat. I, I mean, I'm just saying this. I, I'm definitely uh, not saying anything about <laughs> what you should, you should not do. But I'm just talking about um, uh, taste. Another one is smell. Um, this is Ginkgo Bioworks, a company in uh, Boston. And one of their projects is to think about uh, growing from bacteria and from microorganisms smell. So they're actually simulating different kinds of smell that might be like rose or jasmine or something that we already know. Well, of course, perfumers or artists might think, well, what kind of new smells might, what might we be able to create? But as you can see, the first thing that we do is to go back to what we already know, the old paradigms of rose, jasmine, what we know. So it's interesting to see that these are new kinds of sensory experiences that we're designing for. Coming back to this. I'll finish up by talking a little bit about a course that I teach um, and workshops I do uh, around the world with um, thinking about these five senses. So um, what I've done in the past, one of the examples have been to think about three different aspects of these senses. So discovery. Discovery might be something more like collective or broadcasting or community, um, being able to kind of serendipity, research or search. Um, sharing is quite different where it's more about collective, it's about us being together, being able to communicate. Personal is much more about privacy, um, inclusive, uh, exclusivity and the self secrets. And so I give these contexts to the students and to the people who I work with 
and uh, I bring all sorts of objects. And so in Copenhagen, we've had we've had all sorts of objects that the students can play around with. And um, one of the groups actually made seeing themselves in third perspective. So everything that they made, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, it was always about the third perspective. So because we always see each other in the first perspective. So this is kind of a project that they made, that they had like a camera in the back of their head. Very, very, like they made this in a day. <laughs> so, so it's very crude prototypes just to get a sense for what it felt like. And of course, no one wants to wear this, but um, they put on a virtual headset and they could see themselves. And so that was really interesting. Another experiment that we did was, um, you might do it with yourselves, I'm sure <laughs> you won't, but consider it. Um, you might know each other by name, um, by the way you look. But I asked the students who have been together for the last, let's say, year, I asked them to sit in front of one another and hold each other's hands, and one group did not know the other group, and asked them to try to guess who the other person is. And some people could and some people couldn't. So probably most of us haven't shaken hands or know what each other's hands might feel like. So that's an aspect of perceiving touch that we don't know. But you, I might even give you different materials and you might know that one is metal because it's cold or because whatever, and the other one is not. So digital objects, the same. We have to think about it in those ways. So this was kind of funny, <laughs> trying to touch. And he, she kept on calling him a girl and he was like, I'm not a girl. <laughs> But we also did projects with um, smell and taste together, so removing the sense of smell while eating something. And certainly the students could not necessarily s taste certain things, like mint did not taste like anything when they removed the smell. So the absence or the addition of different senses created different kind of experience for uh, the designers. Um, and then some of them wrote down their ideas of what those smells might be. So we gave them different smells and so forth. And we also gave them objects that they could experience. Um, of course, not all of this is very low tech because it was a very quick workshop. Um, one of the experiences was to give them objects that uh, allow them to hear different things. So one of them was a steth stethoscope. And so they went around the room and tried to kind of uh, hear other people or hear like objects within the room and so that's a kind of filter to the world. You can already see that uh, for example Oculus Rift has APIs for um, changing voice and so you can actually bring that into Unity well which is a game engine and you can design uh, different voices for characters that you design so sound actually becomes a really important uh, way to communicate something uh, in that world as well. This is another project someone did and they envisioned having a haptic uh, glove that they could uh, read a book and as they went over uh, a haptic experience like here's a warm ocean waves uh, that they could feel it in their hands so that uh, just by haptic they could read the story, but sometimes feel that sensation. And these are kind of more poetic experiments with the designers, but thinking about um, the different senses made them be able to connect the senses that they don't normally uh, connect. So um, I'd like to finish by saying that how we represent the world is how we perceive it, but also vice versa, is that how we perceive the world is how we represent it, because how I perceive it like the questions I asked you about mor morality is how I would want to present. I might say, I should own everything in this room and you cannot access it. <laughs> or say, everyone can access. So thank you. That's it.